you. Now that I have a microphone. Oh, Thank you. Testing, testing. Ooh, nice. Okay, uh, thinking about this, Joe Hill came to me months ago and, and came up with this idea, and I thought it was a wonderful idea because on Wednesday nights, we are always talking about what's right in front of us, a project, a license, entertain, wh whatever it is. We never get together to talk about really big picture things 30, 40, 50 years in the future and with the public like this, so I thought it was a great idea. My vision, one of my visions for, I would say, 30 years from now is with education. Um, I th I've been thinking about this for a while, and again, this is a vision statement, not how exactly we're going to how we're going to do it, how we're going to fund it. I think it, uh, it, in two different ways. How do we bring uh, schools here, schools of innovation, um, a school for uh, preservation in the arts, and for the environment? All things that we have here. So when I when I try to frame this, I try to think of what do we already have here that we can that we can accelerate, we can already use. We have, a, we have things here in our environment nowhere else has in the world. I think we could study those. And I also think June, July, and August, we're stacked up pretty, pretty high. But September to May, we have a room to grow. But how do we grow that's sustainable? How do we bring people here that are invested in our, in our island? And I think education would be the way to go. We have a closed system, we have a, an island that we can control and we can count how many people come here and uh, it's hard to do in any other community that's not surrounded by water. So on one hand I think having a, a, a leadership school, innovation, whether it's uh, UMass Amherst or something we haven't even thought of. And I know education is expensive, but that, so that's one side and the other one would be what do we have here that we could use? We have the best carpenters in the world, we have some of the best artists in the world, yogis, chefs, and if it's not the world, it's definitely in the United States. So how can we use that to um, improve the skills of our current kids in school? So just uh, whether it's a fire station location or somewhere, somewhere else, we have the, the Nantucket Public School of Innovation, and that's where kids go to learn half days to learn how to be a chef. So they don't have to go to Johnson & Wales and spend $60,000, uh, or whatever it is, carpentry. Uh, boat building, whatever we're really, really good at. So I, I try to find things that we already do really well and then, and then blow them up. So for education, I think bringing people here to have schools for, uh, for adults and also for um, public schools that are here. That'd be my dream for 20, 30 years from now to have hundreds of people coming from off island to study things on Nantucket or study innovation, entrepreneurship, and then also for our uh, public school system here. There it is. Thank you, Jason. And now I'm going to change things up a bit and go right to Matt. Oh, I know. Oh, you fooled me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wait. <laughs> now, uh, so uh, I'd say, uh, so at first I'd say I agree 10 years isn't enough. Uh, 30, 40, 50 years out, I would say that my top thing at this point would probably be figuring out how to save downtown. You know, in 30, 40 years from now, I'd like to see us have figured out how to have the pumps and the dikes and the stuff that's going to be necessary uh, to say, you know, otherwise, when you look at the models, it's a, a foot or two of sea level rise and then, you know, seven or nine feet of storm surge. We need to be able to handle that. There are countries that do that. You know, in Holland, they look at one in 10,000, one in 100,000 year storms. We do one in 100 year storms and they happen three times a decade now. So I think that, you know, 30 years from now, I'd like to think that we at least are partway on the path and that our downtown is secure. You know, that would be number one. Another one I would think about, uh, and I love like sort of the big picture and looking at the, you know, the big picture and things, and it's vehicles. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, I said, let's, lim let's put a limit on vehicles. If we don't, here's what's gonna happen. Everyone said that'll never happen. We voted it twice. Uh, and everyone said that will never happen. Uh, you know, it will never be that busy. We won't have that many houses. Well, now everybody is looking, saying, "Geez, they were right." What else did those consultants say? You know, and what? And they warned us that we'll be closing downtown, and the streets will get worse, and you'll close some more streets, and other streets will get worse. So I think we have to figure out how to deal with that. And the analogy I've been using lately is the gondola. And the, I was in, and it sounds crazy, but I'll give you the quick story. I was in Telluride, hadn't been there in 28 years. They have 
two main uh, towns. One is their old town, and a guy that was friends of the Giffords here started a land bank, and they didn't spread out like suburban stroll in the main suburban style in the main town. They started a mountain village with seven, eight-story buildings, very dense with plazas. They linked them with a free gondola. They have 4.1 less million less trips in the last 20 years. They used to go up and down an eight-mile road. It was really dangerous. And so all of a sudden, there's their town, Aspen. You go there, it's like a small city with stoplights and pull-offs and buses everywhere. You go to Telluride, it feels like Nantucket still, feel, or like Nantucket used to feel. And it feels like it did then. So I've been saying at NPDC and at our meetings, I'm saying, what's our gondola? How do we get people out of the, willingly out of their cars because it's a better way of travel? And how do we and how do we do that? You know, is it, is it to get them from the airport to downtown to the Mid Island? You know, is it a gondola? Is it a you know? Is it something else? You know, Transit X is sort of a crazy idea where they've got on a rail. You know, so there's there's things like that, and I would like to think that we've thought about it. And instead of 25,000 cars, we have five or 10,000 that are operating at peak season and people are able to get from their door to wherever they need to go some other manner that doesn't require us to build, you know, Route 130 from Hyannis all over the island. So, but I could go on forever. Sure. Uh, so, one specific thing that gets me really excited about the future on Nantucket is garbage. And I think that um, we have a lot of opportunities in front of us where this is an issue that is being faced globally, but as an island, the conversation is exacerbated, the issue is exacerbated, and we have certain things happening in the near future um, that are going to force us to innovate. And what I think about sometimes is the possibility of closed loop, like Jason brought up, zero waste. We talk about plastic bottles and straws and all this waste that we're generating, and I think with the technology that's available, there's possibility for things like 3D printing, where we could be making our own things on island. And that's a different kind of economy. It's a manufacturing economy. And that small scale manufacturing is the kind of thing that I get excited about. But I think for me, that's really couched in a, a bigger conversation around um, Nantucket and our environment. And what I really hope for 30 years from now, 50 years from now, is that as an island, we found a way to look at some of the issues we're facing um, at this point of tension, constant point of tension between the environment, between how we do things day to day, how we operate, and what drives our economy. And uh, we find a way where the protection and preservation of our natural resources um, drives economic prosperity. Uh, and I, I think that with the uh, select board having strategic um, planning priority of environmental leadership, I think similar along to Jason, we have an opportunity to be um, policy, to be thought leaders in policy education opportunities and really avail of what right now seems like obstacles and use those to look at a future where uh, the environment and economics are um, our are, are thing and we're, we're paving the way. And I see things like that. A year and a half ago, I was very, I was much more pessimistic about this because this is a conversation that has been going on for hundreds of years. But I think, to Matt's point, things like climate change and sea level rise are, are changing the tone of the conversation. And I think that um, things that we're doing now are setting Nantucket up to be at the forefront and leaders in this conversation about uh, environment and leadership Thank you. and garbage. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you all for being here, by the way. Uh, I'm really here to listen tonight. Uh, but I've got a, a, just a couple thoughts uh, that will seem pretty, pretty maybe esoteric, but I hope thought-provoking. But I think, first of all, I think we're in a, we're in a great place to start uh, this conversation, uh, not geographic place, but we, we have a, a community that is uh, very financially sound. Our, our town is very financially sound as evidenced by Moody's recent uh, rating of us as a uh, AAA or bond for our AAA bonds. And it gives us an opportunity to try to do some experimentation that many of us have spoken about. There are a couple things I worry about, uh, and it's really most, most on the economy. Um, I worry about ha not having a robust uh, fishing industry. That's what we're kind of, that's one of the, one of the roots of our community. 
I also worry about, and maybe this isn't a good analogy, but when this community went through a, a big depression, when the whaling industry kind of went away, but um, you know, at some point, you know, we, we, we owe a lot to our economies based on real estate and construction. And at some point, maybe I'm naive, but there, that will wind down. I mean, there's only so much land that we can build houses, and so only so many times houses can be torn down and built up. But what we have to be thinking about opportunities, uh, uh, professional opportunities for those folks that engage in those industries. To really to, and also finally to uh, Jason's point, we are a captive uh, audience, if you will, in a community. Um, in my business in healthcare, uh, people who wanted to start insurance companies like HMOs would say, well, we can never find a defined population of people to try to improve their health, whether it's smoking cessation or whatever, because they'll move to a different town or a different health plan. So it doesn't, it's not financially viable for us to do that. Well, that's not the case here. Um, and I think we have an opportunity, whether it's from health or education, to really try some pretty innovative things, and I'll leave it up to you to decide what those are. Thank you. Thank you. I can really shout. And the other, the other point to that is um, um, I don't even breathe when I talk, so I can just talk. <laughs> I learned a long time ago. How about that? That's just on. It says it's on. It says it's on. There we go. Okay. So, before we get started with all of your comments and questions and contributions to this, I want to do a quick poll. If you've been on island at least 40 years, please stand up. If you've been on island 30 years, stand up. At least 30 years, stand up. 20 years? 10? and less than 10. See, I thought everybody just needed a little bit of exercise because it's cold outside. But I think what's great about that, are my quick informal poll, is that you all get to see that we have a really wide tranche of who's here tonight. So it's people who've been here more recently and people who've been here a little bit longer. And the other poll I want to ask is how many people have read the Nantucket Strategic Planning Framework on the town's website? Show of hands. Okay, great, thank you very much. Now who would like to go first? We also have, oh, let me tell you one more thing. See, this is what I keep doing. Let me tell you one more thing, which is what tonight is not. Tonight is not to talk about current things. There's lots of forums for all the current things going on. Tonight is really to talk about what will happen 2040, 2050. So as and when you bring up something that might be current, please frame it for the future. Thank you. And we have cards, so if, after you've asked your question or made your comment, if you would write it down and then hand it to me at the end, we're going to collect them all and just create a document of all the input that we got tonight. That would be super. Thank you. Who wants to go first? Barbara? Oh, Michael. Thank you. Hi, hi guys. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I'm Michael Kopko. Hi, everybody. Hi, neighbors. I think January, we all know each other pretty well. Um, thank you, thank you guys for being here. And Jason, you'll be pleased to know that um, we are starting a education program at the theater. Um, Sarah Lawrence College has brought their film school here for three months. And so we will be a college campus in town for three months. They've taken the two Yacht Club dormitories for their students. And then our theater and office building will be there campus, so uh, hopefully there will be a place for these kids to get a cup of coffee and a sandwich uh, now and again. But I, what I wanted to talk about the future was that I think that we can all agree that there's not an infinite capacity to grow on the island. I don't think that's a question. So the question then becomes, where is that threshold? When do you get to that point where you say, that's enough? And, and I think that applies to a lot of different issues, but I want to go to cars, which Matt brought up and something we've all been talking about for a long time. And one of the problems is that now we're talking out of both sides of our mouth about this issue. Because on the one hand, we're saying we can't accommodate, we've got to do something about all the cars that are coming here. And on the other hand, 
we, every year we do more to accommodate more cars coming here. We, we, uh, we are, I think, going to institute paid parking. Well, and, and those kinds of solutions we can experiment with now so that in the future, in 2040, uh, we can look back and say, well, that was a stupid idea, and it's a good thing we only put in these kiosks, which we could tear out when we thought it was a stupid idea. But I'm hoping that you as our leaders and, and we as a community will, will think about the big picture and 20 years from now so that we haven't made decisions at this point that affect us 20 years down the road when we're looking at say a huge parking garage on the waterfront that we go well that was a stupid idea but you can't just tear it out after a couple of years when that was a stupid idea so as we as we all agree that we don't have an infinite capacity let's not be afraid at this point to start saying that this is enough this is that decision point so that 20 years from now 40 years from now we're not looking back and thinking boy we should have made that decision then thank you Whoops, that. Oh, like uh, if you could just summarize some of those points. Thank you very much. Who's next? Oh, please, I'll call on people. Thank you. I like calling on the people in the back because that's why they tried to hide. Thank you. I'm Charlie Stott, uh, representing the uh, Nantucket Civic League. And first I want to commend the uh, leadership of the town for uh, embarking on the development of a coastal resiliency plan under the direction of Chuck Larson. Uh, if there's any topic that's got to be considered a part of a solution in the future, that's got to be it. Um, secondly, uh, the Civic League uh, recently adopted a strategic plan that has several elements, including one uh, around transportation, traffic, and parking. And in that plan, we've embraced the notion of paid parking. And what we're particularly intrigued about is the idea of demand pricing so that uh, the closer to the downtown area that you park, the more it costs you. And it may cost you much more to park there on a Friday night than it does on a Monday morning. Uh, they've uh, done this on a pilot basis in Boston and they've had some remarkable results. Finally, I think um, if there's any issue that's really key, it's the whole question of growth, development, and uh, density. And perhaps some consideration ought to be given to revisiting the notion of uh, somehow putting a cap on the population. Some years ago there was an effort to uh, restrict the number of uh, building permits issued. Uh, perhaps that should be revisited. Um, and, and in particular, we ought to look at zoning changes. And I've talked to the chair and finance committee, um, uh, Brian Turbot, about uh, a different approach. It may be difficult to do, but we ought to at least consider it. Any time a bill is introduced in Congress, it's scored by the Congressional Budget Office so the, the legislators know, the members of Congress know exactly what it's gonna cost. Um, state legislatures do the same thing, a fiscal impact. And maybe there ought to be an environmental impact statement as well, but at least a fiscal impact statement. So that when voters go to town meeting to consider a zoning change, uh, they ought to know how much uh, additional revenue, tax revenue, will be uh, generated as a result of this zoning change and they ought to have an estimate as to how many how much the school enrollment is going to increase so what's the impact on the infrastructure road maintenance and the sewer system so that's something that we'd really like to see considered thanks so much okay. i'll give you a it's always easy to hand you a paper afterwards and say please Thank write you. all that down and you know what I find interesting about your comments is, yes, a lot of them are maybe top of mind now, but if you think about it, imagine a future where all of that transparency is available to us as a voting community. That we know that when we vote on something, we understand the full total cost of ownership to us as citizens and as us on the island as to what that can happen. And that would be one of those things that in 2040, 2050 would be outstanding to have. Okay, um, who else with Tobias? Great. So my name is Tobias, Tobias Glidden. Thank you, Denise. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a book I read maybe six or seven years ago. It's um, it was written by Jeremy Rifkin, and it's called The Third Industrial Revolution, and it talks about how um, we're transitioning as a whole society and globally into 
uh, renewable energy, and it's really changing um, the economic paradigm of the world we live in, in the sense that energy is really cheap and it has low impacts on the environment. And I think that's really important because historically, Nantucket was a energy exporter. We exported whale oil all over the world. And that drove our growth as a society. And we were able to have numerous amounts of other industries, a big dairy industry on Nantucket to kind of support that income that was coming here. So when I look ahead into the future, and I think about how do you keep you know, capital and wealth here on the island, you know, besides wealth being transferred through you know, property and off-island people buying property, the number one thing where we move our wealth here on the island to off-island is energy, whether that's in oil, fuel, or electricity. So when we're talking about education, we're talking about um, maintaining a, a fishing industry, when we're talking about paying for protecting downtown, I think it's really important we start from a place of understanding where we're exporting the most amount of our wealth from, and that's our energy. And so I think as a community, when I look out 50 years, I say, there's a, the technologies there, we have the capital, and we have the willpower to do it. Let's go ahead and push for controlling our future and controlling our wealth. Everybody wins a pencil and a card. Who else would like to? Yes. Come running up to you. I feel like the price is right. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Amanda Cross. I recently moved back here full time. I'm playing off the, um, the issue about cars is the opposite of the issue of public transportation. I mean, one, can I just ask a question that I'd like to answer now? Do you have any sense now that you have year-round public transportation? Are you seeing an increase in use of it? Or is it, um, because it's, to me it's a chicken and egg problem. I live out in the wall when it road. I, there, it's not useful for me the way it is now, but if it's built and maybe it's built in such a way that it's a, it's a lost leader in the beginning, or maybe it's in terms of where you're looking at population increases, if you have a way for people to get around the island, you're going to hopefully decrease the cars, not just by saying you just can't have a car. Um, so I was just wondering if you're looking at that side of it. And you have to do coastal re resiliency like now. Mm -hmm. It is not 10 years from now. It is now. Amanda, thank you. David? Yes. I'd be happy to answer some of that if you want, Denise. Yeah, go ahead, Jason, and then I'm going to... Okay, I'll do it really quick, and I know Matt has a lot to say. So I, I, the, the loss leader is it is that way this year. We have to do it for one, two, three years to get people used to it. I ride, it's right across from where I work, so I, I just jump on and go out to Tom Nevers. And anybody, I'm like, I'm the weirdo on the, on the bus, and I'm like, so what do you do? Where do you work? How much do you use it? I'm just trying to you know, ask people questions. And one guy said... Um, it's like I use it every day for work and I said would you do you have a car he said no but if I didn't have the year-round bus I would have to buy a car and then when I leave I would just sell it so that just told me that was just a one anecdotal uh, example of somebody who didn't have a car because they're using the bus year-round now if you look at the numbers and you look at it's like oh it's not financially sustainable right now but we have to do it for two or three years among other things I think once we get the data we can say okay now let's try to do a shuttle out to Wamanet, or let's do some kind of shuttle that's on, that's on call on service, or some other things that can uh, supplement the current winter bus transit. Matt, do you want to add anything to that? Or? As, as the microphone is making its way, I also just want to add that um, it, it's with some of the other questions or comments that were made about paid parking and some of the things that are here in the now, this board is definitely looking to the future in increasing public transportation services, making the island more pedestrian friendly and bike friendly. In the meantime, I think some of these um, parking solutions that we're working on has to do with the quality of life here and now, managing even things like carbon emissions when people are circling around the um, you know downtown looking for parking space. So there is that balance between having a bit of faith and if you have the around service, people will ride it while also managing what we have now. Well, yeah, no, it's, 
there, it isn't paying for itself now. It, it might not in the winter. Uh, and I'm, I'm look, I'll go up 30 or 40 years. Maybe a fixed route isn't how it's done anymore. Maybe it's done where it's more on demand. Uh, and a fixed route is also, if you think about it, it's on the same roads that all the other cars are. So if you're an hour and a half from the airport to town in the middle of August, the bus is in that same thing. So you have to find some way to separate the things and you have to make it more, uh, you know, 30 or 40 years from now, it has to be better than a car. So I, you know, I think that we have the, you know, the technology now. Uh, I think that the, in, the NRTA, sort of short term, I think some sort of, there's algorithms and there's, uh, you know, micro buses where it, it sends the one or two 12 seat buses to, the, to someone's door and brings them right where they need to go. And it goes on, like, sort of like Uber does, on the right route all day. And something like that, we might go from having 100 people a day, like we have now, up to three or 400, and it might start to make sense. Uh, the downtown parking could help fund all of this. It would, it, would, it would dampen demand, it would provide income, and it would start to give a revenue source to deal with some of these issues in a more proactive, positive way, not just saying we're taking your cars away. So. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Um, thank you all for that response. Um, my name is Morgan Wraith. I grew up here um, and I've come back here to work as a part-time teacher at the Nantucket Public Schools in the high school. Um, and I do a little bit of design work. Um, I graduated with a degree in architecture, so I am going to make a quick suggestion. I'm going to talk about education, but I want to talk about the parking garage real quick. I think that we should put a parking garage in the old power plant property and design it in such a way that we can convert it to affordable housing when it becomes obsolete as a parking garage. Um, I think that'd be a pretty solid idea because eventually we're not going to have cars, but we can stash them there for a bit and then design that in such a way that we can put people there when we need to because um, we're going to increase in density no matter what. Um, I remember what this place was like in the 90s and even as, as a kid and um, it's way different now um, and I'm sure it's just going to keep increasing. What I would love to say about education is that we have an amazing vocational technical department in high school. Um, that I've had the great pleasure of working in for the past two years. Um, I teach a landscape program there, and I, we also have auto tech, carpentry, um, culinary, criminal justice, and nursing. Um, the thing about the carpentry and auto and landscape programs is the kids are getting into there, and they're learning how they can make money, how they can be self-sufficient. They're learning incredible skills. Um, but what we're grossly missing is some kind of marine biological and aquaculture program. Um, so I, wanna, I guess I want to combine two of the comments made by the select board about education and then about a fishing culture that we've totally lost. Um, and I think that there's a lot that we can do as far as, I think I see some other young faces in here, but I definitely would like to see more. And I think that there's a lot we can do in the future to engage young people um, and get them concerned about what our cultural heritage used to look like um, and how intimately that was tied to the ocean. Um, that's, that's a lot, that's my big vision for Nantucket. Thank you. David, more Price is Right. Thank you, uh, David Worth. Um, so this actually plays right off of what Morgan just uh, said. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, what I think about for the next, uh, in the next 30 years is uh, the economic diversity and opportunity here on the island. Um, we're a tourist economy. Uh, we Obviously, many people make their living off of that. Tourist economy is going to be and will remain fundamentally a low wage, and this is relative, low wage economy. And when I look out at um, what a spectacular community it is to work in and look at how could we entice more people to participate in the San Francisco economy or the Pittsburgh economy, the technology economy that many of us, our children, are part of, and what do we need to do here on the island to make those opportunities available. I think the schools do a great job of training and providing the vocational programs to support the kind of economy we have today. I don't think the schools are even thinking about what we should be doing to train people for the next 10, 20, or 30 years so that they can remain on Nantucket, they can have a good wage and a good, make a good living and begin to diversify our economy so it is not dependent on tourism. 
And that to me is, is such a fundamental um, question and opportunity that goes all the way from what we do in the schools and what kinds of programs we're offering there uh, all the way up to the kind of support we provide for the infrastructure so that more and more people who have uh, ties to the mainland economy can call Nantucket their home. Thank you. Okay, excellent, thank you. Yes. Um, hi everybody, I'm Katharina Buccino. I'm an eighth grade student here on Nantucket. Um, so I've kind of been seeing a lot in my school at least is that we have a lot of teachers, but we're, well, sorry. I think that we need to think more ahead into the future about how many kids are going to be going to our schools because I know we just had this amazing building put up at, for the intermediate school and it really <laughs> brought down a lot of the stress on some of the teachers because I remember my brother talking about having music teachers and art teachers like carrying carts around to classrooms because they don't have their own room and I think that we kind of need to think more ahead about that with also the middle school because I know several teachers, several of my teachers also, who don't have their own room to teach in. And I don't think that makes a very good teaching environment for them to have their own space and to store their own equipment if they want to have more advanced studies in their class. So I think that we need to like, I don't know, find a way to project how many kids we're going to be having in the future, not just the near future, but we want to make sh sure that we can have a building that will be able to support the increasing amount of students coming into our schools. So, yeah. Thank you. Yes. I don't want to make the rest of the room feel bad, but this is a pretty active section of the room. Just, you know, no peer pressure or anything. Thank you. My name is Patrick Tafe, and um, I think there are really two very important issues so that we can have a future on Nantucket. And one of them would be to have a feasibility study done to determine the carrying capacity on the island. My, my biggest fear is overdevelopment. I, I think we're being overdevelopment, overdeveloped. Um, so it's great to talk about all the things we'd like to have in the future, but let's figure out what the island can handle. When will we need a new sewage treatment plant? When will we need a new high school? Um, when will our groundwater be contaminated? When will we not be able to get rid of our waste? So if we could determine at an early stage now um, what the population, what, what the island could support in a population, and it's cohesive, everyone's happy. Um, and the second thing that I think is really important looking forward, if what's predicted with the sea level rises if, if we're not, and Matt, you said something about like Holland, they, ha they have ways to deal with uh, floods. Um, we need to really look at that because will we have a downtown wharf? Will we have a downtown? Um, if we don't take these on first, it really doesn't matter what we plan for in, in 30, 40, 50 years. Um, we either may not be able to do it or people just won't want to be here. Um, I just think we need to figure out how many people the island can support um, because we are finite. And because we are finite, I think we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Denise, can I just, um, yep. Go I ahead, just want to make uh, one recommendation. And um, uh, I just want to make one recommendation before the next question. Uh, hello? Hello? Is that better? Uh, not on. Um, uh, just very quick, because there's a quite a, um, a couple comments that there's a, there's a couple themes coming up, and it's carrying capacity, limits to growth, education, investment in education, investment in the next uh, industry, economy, what comes next. And it's a book, actually, that Matt gave me, and it's by Woody Tash, who is here on Nantucket, and it's called Soil. And it, it's um, for pretty much everyone that has asked the question, it, it really sets a, a sort of a new framework for how to think about 
again, all these things that are coming up that we've been talking about for so long since the Industrial Revolution, but again, because of coastal resiliency, because of carrying capacity, because of space, because of more people and density, we have to think about it differently, and we have to think about our economies differently. And so it's uh, just a book recommendation that I wanted to make to everyone because it's very interesting and it helps with that conversation and looking at how we frame that. And he does have some Nantucket experience, so I think it's a good one. It's called Soil. Thanks, Rita. Hi, my name is Peter Schaefer. Um, mine's more of a caveat than a, than a suggestion. Um, we have to remember that tourism is always going to be the base of this island. Uh, 30 years from now, I assume tourism is still going to be our biggest producer of income on the island. And my caveat is, big city solutions to problems aren't going to work on Nantucket. So when we talk about congestive pricing, or we talk about parking meters, or whatever we might want to talk about, that's I'm just talking about parking, but in other issues as well, those solutions take away the magic of Nantucket. And I think we, we need solutions for all those problems, but I don't think we can use the Boston solution or the New York solution to solve them. Hi, Tom Ayers. Um, sort of tying into what you were saying about water and, and that, um, I'm just thinking back to, um, I lived in Santa Barbara and they had a water moratorium so you couldn't build more houses because there wasn't enough water. And I know we don't live in a semi-arid climate, but at some point there's got to be some kind of study to, you know, how much water do we have and how many people can it support. Um, and, you know, at some point you have to put in some kind of moratorium. And, you know, in that case, the only way you could build a house was to on an existing footprint. Um, so that, and we kind of have that with, you know, the, the, um, you know, the HDC. You can't, there's things you can't do. Um, so that's, I don't know the answer to that question on the island, but I'm assuming somebody does, or if not, it needs to be part of a strategic plan. Who's next? Yes, Christy. No, I'm just kidding. Mm. Kidding. Joke. <laughs> Christy Farantella. I know tonight's question was, how do we see Nantucket in 2030 and beyond? And I just wanted to say, I really hope that we make it more pedestrian friendly. I know that that is a current theme, but I know living in a city for a couple of years, I would look on Google Maps, and if it was under 20 minutes, I walked. There was, you know, the bus would never take me there in less than 20 minutes. Um, so I always walked. And here, I feel like I look, and that's not an option. There's always a little sign on Google Maps that says, you know, take caution. This is not a pedestrian route. And so I really would love for this to be con taken forward through 2030 and beyond to make sure that it's pedestrian friendly. <coughs> hand the microphone right down one <sighs> Hi, um, I'm Mary Bergman, and when I think about Nantucket in 20 or 30 years or beyond, I, I think about who's not here, and sorry, <laughs> wow, I didn't think I was going to cry, oh, Jesus, because I will be here, you know, thank you, Toby picked my name out of a fishbowl, and I own my house in Sations <laughs> Pass, but how many people leave all the time? Oh, all the time you know really creative thoughtful people and I think do I want to live in a place where I don't know anyone because it's you know the one percent sorry the high the wealthy and the people who are serving them you know we're, we are we going to lose this whole cultural thing you know whether it's fishermen or it's artists I mean you couldn't come here and be an artist today you couldn't come here and be an actor today and I understand you know I have a real job and then I do my art other things on the side. But I guess I just think about, are we going to lose that part of our soul if we don't have a place for people to live? You know, if we have this school, like Jason was talking about, that's great, but where are those people going to be even in the wintertime? And, you know, I know everybody, what's like the most popular Nantucket Facebook group is the days of yore. Everybody is looking back at like, you know, this, when this was a fun place to be. 
and I cannot believe that I'm crying. <laughs> but so I guess that's what I think about is how do we maintain that authenticity that makes people want to come here? Because that is a big part of why people are attracted to this place, because it's real. But are we going to lose that if we don't have all the things that we've discussed? So, okay. <laughs> and Mary, thank you for that. And thank you for being so authentic on that topic, because I think one of the things that underpins any vision or any looking to the future is actually the emotional connection we all have to Nantucket and to the island. And I always often, people ask me why I live here. I've lived all over the world. And I say, because this is a community that votes its values so often. When you go to town meeting, when you look at the things that are proposed in citizen articles, they are very value-based, not necessarily economically based, but values-based. And so I think that fact that you are you know, very emotionally engendered in what's happening in the next 30 years, I think everyone else is too. So thank you for being so open. Who's next? On this side, come on this side. Yay! Hi, Fran Cartonen. I have something really prosaic, but 40, 50 years from now, I hope that there will not be a single utility pole or overhead wires to be seen on the island. If I could give an award for to the point, Fran, you would have gotten it in two seconds. Who else? Hi, I'm Holly McGowan. Um, I would like to see that we progress more in, in uh, helping to solve our behavioral health needs on the island. I think that we have so many gaps um, in our system and, um, and that it's, uh, you know, it has an impact on the health of our community members. And if we're going to be a healthy community in, in other ways in terms of the environment and um, sustainability, I think it's equally as important to have a health for our, our community, mental and physical health. Hi, I'm Marty McGowan. I've been in business here for 47 years and been coming since 1966. Arrived in Sconset and thought I had landed in heaven. No TV, but a lot of fun. Looking forward to the vision of the future of Nantucket is very important to all of us. And I think that um, I'd like to synopsis some of the thoughts that I've heard here in this conversation with ideas that I've carried for a very long time. One is that the community of Nantucket needs to embrace forms of new economy, forms of new economy which allow us to survive, economy um, that involve education, education that leads to development of soft in industry, as well as health care. With great schools and great hospitals, MGH isn't going to send people to Nantucket to get an operation. We have to earn those places. We've earned being a destination. We can earn anything we want. It's really as simple as that. Matt can answer the question about how much sewer do we have and how much water we have. And the question about energy, great questions. We could take, even though the charter up at Chicken Hill says this is only to be used for passive use, we can take land bank land, we can build an underground parking facility in a convenient location, and we can use that sand 
to nourish the beach. Have any of you been to um, Maya Comet Pond and then you take a right and you take a walk and you walk over to Ladies Beach? On the way there, there's a really high dune. I like that beach. I call it High Dune. It's got to be 40, 50 feet high. This dune is absolutely stunning. You walk over it, there's a whole nother plain with beach grass, and then you fall down to the sea. It's a perfect example. It's not the favorite view idea if you happen to live on the beach to have a 40 foot hill in front of you. But it's an idea for the restoration of the coastal island, which may provide us with both sea and shore. So it lends that education. That provides us education. We should be putting forward an idea of how each project that we have could contribute to the future of our island. If we have a substantial or even an increased value education because of security. Think of security around the world. Everyone's worried about security. They really are. Being safe is important. Nantucket is an isolated opportunity to be one of the safest places you could ever go. And if you can work from here because we have the highest resolution internet system, you could work from here anywhere all over the world. What do we need? Toby, what do we need? A satellite? A wire? A wire I don't like, but... Don't jack up the rates, jack up the power. So, in, in the future of Nantucket, I'd like to step off the sidewalk, step out of my car, and I don't want to step into a pile of mud. I want the sidewalks to go to the street. I don't want any telephone poles. I think we got charged a tax for years, right, to take down all the telephone poles in town, which we paid for, which the electron, electric company kept the money. I don't have seen those poles go down because of that millions of dollars that we collected. I'm not finished. I know, so, but you will be in a minute. <laughs> so in the future, we have convenient, safe areas to train in town for us to get to. We think about our projects as how they benefit our coastal wetland, and we buy a Generac that eats all the garbage on the island and produces energy for the island. And we're done with that one too. So all of these things, they're doing it in Norway right now. And that's it. Thank you. You can summarize some of the key points. It'd be lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. You know, there's always someone that invites me to help them finish. Anyway, yes. Hi, I'm Pete Sendelbach. I just had a question. I feel like about 20 years ago, we worked really hard to come up with a comprehensive plan, and then we didn't hear much about it after that. Uh, where is that and what happened to it? That's you, Matt. <laughs> I, it went, it went, well, I could be wise. I could be wise about this, but uh, some, some of it has been implemented, a lot of it hasn't. Uh, some of the people, like we talked about Woody Tash earlier, who found it sustainable in Nantucket, were disappointed in some of the actions that happened in our planning department and they quit and left the island. Uh, so I think, you know, but I think Think some of this is slow going. And, uh, you know, in the changes, you move at the speed of government. And I say that, and I get dirty looks from the people that work in government, but that's the truth. It moves slowly, and some of it has changed. Our, you know, our finance department's a lot better now. We have, uh, you know, the, the, I, I wasn't even at the MPEC meeting, and they put car limitations back into the transportation plan. So I think there's been, there was slowly building an awareness of sustainability of limitations, et cetera, that weren't there. Uh, we're at the point now where there has to be an update to the, uh, what it, the master plan, which uh, hopefully will be more than just you know, someone writing it and, and doing what 
you know, sort of, I hope it'll be inclusive and people's voices, especially on these big issues, will be heard so that we do have sort of more of a blueprint and something to aspire to, to do better, is what I would say. Uh, I'm not happy with some of the implementation, but some of it I am happy with, so. Thank you, Matt. So I'm very respectful of all your time. It is almost 6.25. We are scheduled to finish at 6.30. So I have another poll question for you, and then I'm going to ask each of our select board members to kind of summarize and wrap up so I don't have to do it. So get ready, select board members. Was this useful? Would you want to do something similar again? And is an hour probably the right amount of time? Okay. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason to... Well, Jason, I'll have you go last. Rita, you go first this time. Uh, I, I just really want to thank everyone. I think everyone's comments uh, were very insightful and it's, it's actually an amazing forum to be able to sit here and listen to um, what the community has, uh, what is on the top of your minds. And I think that many of the things that came up are on the top of our minds as well. And we are trying to figure out how do you, again, address them in the here and now, but keep those visions into the long term. Um, and, and again, I, I think that everything that came up is, is on the top of our minds, maybe not as quickly or as loudly enough, but they are there. So I think the key to making this work and, and sort of realizing some of these visions is for increased civic engagement, increased community voice, realize and acknowledge when the town administration, the town government is making headway because we hear about a lot of the, the sort of the complaints and the grumblings, but to Matt's point, you know, there are some very good things going on. So I, I think having that uh, back and forth between the community is essential. So I just want to thank everyone. Jim, please. Um, probably, I don't know if it's against the rules to bring up a new issue, but one thing I wanted to speak to and I didn't, I really didn't hear much of it was, how do we really become a more of an integrated community? Um, how do we, um, and I guess I'm reflecting on the, um, you know, the tragedy of uh, the terrorist act at the Africa Meeting House, and how do we um, involve people of color? How do we involve people of the immigrant community in our community? Um, I'll just put a pitch in for it. There are a lot of, a lot of elective offices coming up. Uh, there's an election coming up. I encourage people that don't have, don't, haven't participated to, to think about participating. Um, and uh, but again, thank you all for being here, and it was really enjoyable to listen to. Matt? Oh, got it. Thanks. A uh, couple of follow-ups. Uh, Charlie was asking about understanding what things cost before you do it. There's, I'm pushing hard now for development impact analysis of all major decisions. I've sent samples of what it is uh, to the town administration, and we, we were all in support of understanding our impacts before we vote on zoning, et cetera. So I hope in 30 years, I'm doing, following the rules, I hope in 30 years we've you know, adopted that and understand things more fully, uh, and they aren't just political decisions. Uh, and the other thing we really haven't talked a lot about, we mentioned housing in passing, and it's a huge issue. Uh, and, you know, and hopefully in 30 years or 40 years, we found a way to incentivize the various tiers of housing, but we can't do it, you know, but we have to build density in the right places with no impact on the environment. And we can't, we can't spread it willy-nilly all over the island. Uh, there are right places to build. Like our there are communities all around the country now who are putting density in. And what they're copying, new urbanism, is copying downtown Nantucket. They're copying walkable places. And then they add a few more stories. So when we start to have to build in right places, people have to, you know, have the, you have to say, you know, that is the right place to do it. If we want to build a larger building near the stop and shop, People have to have the vision and support it. When we want to connect a road so that it's, so there's more, it, we have more connections and things work better for the whole neighborhood and the whole island, people have to support it rather than say we can't do that. And so I think you know, some of this, there are good things that we can do going forward. And, uh, you know, but I think this is a good venue. I think it's great to talk about these issues. And I love looking at the big picture. Thank you, Matt. Um, before Jason wraps up, I just wanted to say thank you to Latina and Alicia for your hospitality tonight and for making all this possible for us. So if we could give them a round of applause.
And with that, I am shutting off my microphone and letting Jason close the evening. Thank you, Denise. We give a round of applause for Denise for moderating. <laughs> Kept us all on task. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their comments. This was very thoughtful, and uh, we didn't get tomatoes thrown at us, and I couldn't write down enough. Um, it's, it's very, very helpful for us. And some of the stuff we're doing, but it also refocuses us as well. So I tried to take as many quotes as I could, so I like to summarize and do a little rapid re, re, kind of recap before we leave to, to end this. And I'm just going to try to read my really bad handwriting. Uh, here's some of the quotes that I heard tonight that I liked. What's our gondola? Making our own things on island with a 3D printer. And these might not, my, the quotes might not be perfect, so I apologize. Um, third Industrial uh, Revolution book. We'll look into that. We move wealth off island through energy. Design a parking garage to be converted into housing when we don't need it anymore. Diversify economy so it doesn't depend on tourism. I think that was a theme we heard a lot. Find a way to project the future number of students in our schools. Will we have a downtown 30 to 40 years from now? Big city solutions take away the magic of Nantucket. We should be more pedestrian friendly. In 30, 40 years, who is not going to be here? I thought that was a very, very good uh, way of thinking about it, Mary. Uh, a community that votes its values. Uh, I hope there will be no utility poles. Nantucket needs to embrace new forms of economy. A couple left here. We can earn whatever we want. Don't jack up the rates, jack up the power. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. And I'm going to be next door at Charlie Noble if anybody else wants to talk to me and continue this conversation. Thank you.